Hey guys, so right out of the gate let's talk about Yamato Shackles because it is one of those times where there's more than a little bit of a double meaning behind them. On one hand she definitely is shackled to Wano and her father as she's unable to use her power which that in itself is kind of the ultimate symbol of just their relationship in itself and that Kaido does not let, let anyone he deems useful to him out of his grasp even if they're family and not only that but you can tell he wants he wants her in the position of power he has laid out for her because be, well, pretty much because as another form as another form of control because whatever power Yamato possesses wink wink nudge nudge as in the manga readers he also needs that power in order to retain dominion over Wano. Like whatever power, whatever power Yamato has, Kaido like knows that that power is is the kind of power he's he needs. That even his power, his his devil fruit power alone, is not enough in order to maintain dominion over Wano. He needs her power as Yamato's power as well, and and the only way he c he could control it and her is by slapping those sea stone shackles on on her, onto Yama. Like, and, and on Yamato's end of it, though, just from the way she talks, you can tell that it's not just the handcuffs tying her to Wano. Like, even though she hasn't specifically said anything about this yet, you can tell that that, that, that she also had that Yamato is kind of keeping a secret. Like, almost like there's kind of this unspoken promise she feels she has fulfilled to Wano in no instead before she goes on out on her own even more than that but even more than that what's what's happening here right now in this moment if you couldn't tell is that and and just through the entire conversation with Luffy is that in this one moment Yamato is already being set up as the final straw hat by the end of the circle like even if even if we see, even if she forces herself onto the crew, she will be a straw hat pirate. Like that, that's the one thing I think I think it is key to get across with this with this episode, is that it's it's right right now it's art it's set it's set in stone that at one at immediately after this arc, um, Yamato will be a straw hat. Like that, that's kind of set in stone now at this point. And yeah, I'll be uh. I mean, more than a little, like, it's it's one of those things where, like, Yam like Yamato was kind of the furthest out of left field I expected. Look, looking back, like, Yamato was the furthest out of left field I expected to kind of join the Strats, but look, especially considering in many respects she kind of has a similar personality traits to Luffy, but I, I guess that that is also kind of what made her, like, one of the key, one of, one of the key, one of the key candidates to become like the last straw hat, so to speak. Like at like at this like Yamato is basically the, the final ten. Like back all the way back in the beginning, Luffy talked about having ten crewmates, and now Yamato is basically that final crewmate now. Um, the other major thing to talk about in this episode, though, is obviously the Yakuza samurai confronting Kanjiro, and. I'll really be curious to see how the anime is going to handle this balancing act, frankly. Because right now, we're seeing the side of Kondro that is completely detest a, det a completely detestable scumbag. But as you'll learn much later on, even though he doesn't show it in his final moments, even everything he said to, everything he said to Kiko, even that in itself, to an extent, will turn out to be an act and a lie. And the thing is, despite giving more focus to the purely detestable side of Kanjiro, the anime is already kind of doing something the manga couldn't, which is there are little moments and emotional ticks, little key moments and emotional ticks from Kanjiro that are actually making me care more about the character th than I did in the manga. And granted, we're still a ways from seeing his final moments, but even that is going to be the ultimate... But for me, that's going to be the ultimate test for Toei in my eyes, which is they've already crossed the threshold of making me care a lot more about him than, than I did in the manga. But whether they can send him off in a way that makes me shed a tear for him, something, the, again, the manga couldn't just couldn't do, is the better question. Because in a lot of ways, Kondro is more of a tragic example of the hatred and persecution towards the Kurozumi than Orochi is. And in some ways, I did care more about what happened to him compared to Orochi, but but it wasn't by a very slim. It was only by a very slim margin as well. Like 
I guess what I'm saying, even even though the anime right now is making me care more about Conjuro than I did before, I'm also kind of just thinking in my head, are they going to be able to stick the landing on this? It keeps. Are they going to be able to keep pushing like a lot of the emotions with Conjuro as far as it can go to make me actually give a shit about Conjuro's final final moments? I, like I, I want to be shitting a tear at least one tier when when that time comes and i i know that basically i'm kind of giving away spoilers with it kind of kind of dancing around spoilers with it and giving away spoilers with this one but yeah i just kind of needed to get that off my chest like i'm kind of hoping that's the one thing that the anime can accomplish is making me care about what happens to conjure on the end um now, if I'm being honest, there are two problems I did have with this episode. The first, obviously, being pacing. Like, I feel I'm going to be repeating this a lot, but we are definitely entering the slowdown phase of the arc, and Toei is using any opportunity I can to pad out the runtime. Runtime now, like, it's, it's basically finalized now. But here's the thing, and I really need to make this clear for anyone watching. For me personally, the slowdown of Wano is still in a lot of ways more entertaining and a lot better handled than the slowdown with Dressrosa. Like, with Dressrosa, that was unbearable to watch for me. Like, e even now, even with all the episodes released, the, 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 that pretty much shit is still so unbearable to the point where the only way I can watch it anymore, oddly enough, is with either with One Piece or the dub. But with Wano, it feels a lot more like just a mild annoyance, and part of that is... Unlike with Dressrosa, where they just use the same flashback over and over, I can see parts where they're trying to be slightly more creative in how they handle the padding. Again, it's not always great, and, and there are still, like, flashbacks used in each episode, but you can see just at least a little bit more of an attempt compared to... a little more attempt alongside the obvious stuff they use to pad. Um, with that said, the other problem I do have, though, is art and animation, which... While, while still while still holding up pretty well this episode, I did feel it fumbled a little bit as there were more as there were a couple moments I found watching this episode where it felt like Toei took a couple shortcuts in order to with the animation a bit. But now that now the, all these moments are very quick and easy to miss, but that they are there again. Not many will even notice, but when, when you when you do find them, they, they will stick out. Um, but yeah, guys. That's pretty much all I've got for this review. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, Analyst Control. Be sure to hit the notification bell, hit the subscribe button, and just share the video around, guys. Dark Knight of Anime, signing off. Later, everyone.